All right, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around and uh, uh, allowing us to invade your basement my, for another segment. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if uh, you can talk about um, being a teacher of brass instruments. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of times trumpet, high, high brass players won't go to low brass players because there, there, there seems to be a difference in, you know, the, the, the problem of pressure, the amount of airflow, these kinds of things. That's what, that's what they're focusing on. I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, I have lots of thoughts on that. I have uh, all brass players come to me, trump, trumpet players and trombone, horn, and tuba. Interesting, I, interestingly, I, I think I teach more horn players really? than any other brass instrument. And, and probably because I've had so many uh, people who've come to me with that instrument who've had great success and they keep sending me their students. So, um, but the approach is uh, exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you play a trumpet or a tuba. That um, there's no different techniques. There's no di uh, no different approach to creating music, creating sound on either instrument. And so you mentioned air pressure and airflow, and I understand the air pressure. There's differences in air pressures and airflow, but we can't detect those differences. We have no way of detecting air pressure and airflow while we play. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people try to create a detection, a useless detection. It, it, mean, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but our subconscious brain has absolute awareness of air pressure and airflow to produce the sound. But our conscious awareness is very minimal. An analogy that I like to use is that in this room, there are all kinds of radio signals telephone signals, all kinds of electronic uh, microwaves that mm -hmm. are uh, present in this room right now, but we can't detect them. And it would be useless for us to try without a device. So we have to have a phone in our hands, we have to have a radio, we have to have some sort of device that can detect these signals. When we try to, to um, create awareness of airflow and air pressure while we're playing, we're trying to detect something that's not detectable. But what is detectable while we play? The sound that we want to produce. Mm -hmm. And the sound has to be the motivating factor. So I don't talk about air pressure or airflow. I talk only about the sound. And there's a part of the brain, the subconscious part of the brain, that has complete awareness and control, and not, of, not only of air pressure and airflow, but all aspects of producing sound on the instrument. And all we have to do is send the message to the subconscious by creating an awareness in the conscious mind. And so the imaginative mind should focus on the sound that we want to produce. Jacobs talked about this very specifically. He said, go for the product. The product is never blowing. The product is never fingering. The product is the sound we want to come out of the instrument. That's the motivating factor. So the fact that uh, air pressures and air flows are different on different instruments, the mouthpiece size is different, means absolutely nothing. Recently I had um, um, a friend of mine who was a very successful trumpet player for many, many, many years, decided he wanted to begin playing the trombone. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm having great success with the trombone. And it, he said, that, well, it must have something to do with the uh, length of embouchure and the size of the mouthpiece. I said, no, it has nothing to do with either one of those. I said, you have a lot of uh, negative conditioning associated with struggling with the trumpet for many, many years. I call that baggage. You don't have any baggage with a trombone. And uh, so you have a new start with the trombone. You don't have a history of failure with the trombone. That's why you're finding it easier to play the trombone. If, if, if what you're telling me is true, that the this, this small mouthpiece has a negative in, impact on the trumpet players, I said that that would be true if there were no great trumpet players. There are many successful trumpet players in the world, and uh, so that can't possibly be true. So uh, my approach to teaching all brass instruments, and I do teach all brass instruments and woodwind instruments, I've had, and for many years actually I taught uh, orchestra too, and I had the same approach with the string players as well, is to focus on the music. And um, this allows the subconscious brain to take care of whatever is necessary to produce the music. So the sound is always the motivating factor. So much of, uh, of uh, what you saw early in Jake, Jake's teaching when you first went to him in the 60s, what did you, what did you notice, if anything, 
you know, you would uh, you had you had a, a formalized course of study um, from '66 to '73, and then you had a couple lessons later. But then you would go to some of the classes at Northwestern. Did you notice any change in his pedagogy over the years? There was a, a progressive change because he had so many physical limitations in his own uh, in his own life. He wanted to learn how to overcome his physical limitations. And he had an interest in the study of medicine, so he studied anatomy and all that, that sort of thing. Um, I contend that if you did not take lessons on uh, Normal Avenue on the south side, in the home, in the basement of that home, mm -hmm. you'd never really studied with Jacobs. The, the downtown thing or the northwestern thing was not the same. And there are very few few of us around anymore mm -hmm. who actually uh, had that opportunity. Did you ever have an opportunity? Not to? a normal, no. No. No, just I've, the stories. I've been communicating with uh, Toby Hanks lately, and uh, I used to go up the stairs. He used to send me up the stairs to uh, answer the door, and Toby would be there, Bobo would be there. All these great musicians would be there. And um, in the early days, he used the distraction of uh, various devices to distract the, the player from all the physical feedback that was interfering with their brain. They were getting so much negative feedback physically that was being induced by the instrument and uh, it was impacting their brain so they couldn't focus on the music anymore. Mm -hmm. And so he would use these devices to distract them from that. Here, blow up these balloons and, mm -hmm. and these balls and make this to go up in the air and that sort of thing to distract them from the, the physical input to the brain and uh, one of the things that I found was that uh, the ultimate distraction was the music that I didn't I don't use the, the physical devices to distract the student I use the music to distract the students mm -hmm. and that's where we ultimately we have to go anyway um, that he moved from Less of that uh, use of uh, devices and uh, analysis, the physical analysis, more to the psychological aspect of it. And uh, I think he realized that's where he really needed to focus the most. Um, some of that came from uh, people who had uh, studied with me, and he noticed that that was where I was going. Because they, they would take lessons with me, and then mm -hmm. they would go back and take lessons with him. and. Um, uh, I was. I'm, I only focus on the psychological aspect. I, I don't, could care less what you look like. I don't care what the student feels like. I care the most of what they sound like. Um, so there might have been some influence there. I don't know. Uh, we never actually discussed it, but um, I saw that uh, transition in his own his own work. Roger, uh, uh, it's well known, well documented. Uh, Mr. Jacobs was always talking about but her son. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, during your time uh, uh, sitting in for Mr. Jacobs, subbing for him, also playing extra and playing uh, just in the CSO and around the CSO, did you ever have a sense of what Mr. Herseth thought of Mr. Jacobs? Well, there was a tremendous amount of respect. They were both uh, unique and great artists. They were world-class artists. They were uh, performed at a level that uh, we only see once in several generations and they found themselves on the stage of a great orchestra at the same time. Um, there was nothing but uh, a mutual admiration society going on there. And Jake talked about the fact that he felt that Bud was the greatest uh, brass player he ever heard, and um, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, Bud felt the same way. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm at RogerRocco.com, I mentioned the fact that uh, Mr. Hurst had passed recently, and I said that Bud and Jake are together again. Mm -hmm. They were together to, on that stage for so many years, and uh, hopefully they're together again uh, in the next life. And uh, a mutual admiration society. And they both had a way of uh, leading the orchestra and having a tremendous impact on the orchestra with their musical leadership and the quality of song for both of them was totally unique. I've never heard a trumpet sound anywhere like I heard from Mr. Herseth. And I've never heard a tuba sound anywhere. I recently had a discussion with Mike Sanders in St. Louis 
regarding our experience. We both took lessons mm -hmm. on the south side with, with mm -hmm. Jake. And um, the living room was right above the studio. And when you would come for your lesson, you sat in the living room ahead of the time. Yeah. And um, whenever Jake would pick up the horn, you could feel the sound in your feet. Mm -hmm. The impact of the tone was so resonant that you could actually feel it. And you knew immediately uh, the, the difference there. I mentioned to somebody recently that um, when Bud would play the mouthpiece, I could actually feel the sound. It was so intense. The resonance was so powerful, I could actually feel it in my ears. And yet it wasn't uh, you know, in terms of decibels, but in terms of the quality of the resonance, you can actually feel it. And uh, I had an opportunity to sit 10 feet away from him. And uh, there's an interesting story that I tell. I was hoping. Yeah, so it's coming. <laughs> um, Jake would take much of the Ravinia season off because it was such a long commute from yeah, the far well, south side of Chicago right. all the way up to, uh, up to Highland Park up there. So I, it was wonderful for me because I got to play most of the Ravinia. And um, we would rehearse in the morning, and then the concerts would be in the evening. Well, there was no time to go commute all the way back to the south side of Chicago and then go back. And so uh, Bud would hang around all day, and I would hang around all day. And uh, he would walk out onto the stage about 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock concert. He'd walk out onto the stage into his chair and would start to practice. Well, I would do the same thing. I would walk over to my chair. Now, the chair is only 10 feet away from him. And um, I would start practicing on the stage with him. Now, he knew that I was just trying to get as much inf influence from him as possible. And so he never one time did he say to me, hey, kid, there's a tree out there. <laughs> Go take that tube out there and, and play. And I would be, it was like I was auditioning for an orchestra. Yeah. That's how much practicing I would be doing. And never once did that disturb him, did that bother him. Never once did he say to me, go find your own place. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, word kind of got around that this was going on. <laughs> and students from Northwestern and people would come early to the concerts, and they would listen to this event that would be going on before the concerts at Ravinia. He had a tremendous influence on me uh, in terms of his uh, leadership, his musical leadership, and his ability to play the trumpet. And uh, I credit his artistry and his work as much as Jake, but they were both basically the same. They were basically the same, uh, but I included what I heard from, from him as well. And I had opportunities to, uh, I had an opportunity to spend some time with him uh, when the Chicago Symphony used to play in Milwaukee once, once a month. I actually commuted in the car with him. It was five hours in the car with Mr. Herseth talking about brass playing. You could never have, you could, not enough money in the world to, could, to allow you to have that opportunity. And everything that he told me and everything that he, I experienced was reinforcement of what was Jake was telling us. Um, he had to overcome physical handicaps as well. And um, when he did, it brought him to a higher level of awareness of the music. He was forced to come up to a higher level of awareness of the music because he was getting a lot of physical, fe uh, negative physical feedback from his accident. Mm -hmm. And so when his mind became more powerful. This was the accident in the early 50s? Right. Uh, and uh, when his career was basically uh, over and he wouldn't allow that, there were times, there's a story that he, he tells about uh, they were doing uh, Beethoven 9. The Chicago Symphony used to uh, perform live broadcasts on, on uh, television at that time, Sunday afternoon. And he'd be warming up in the studio, and uh, the physical pain would be so great he couldn't play. Most mortal people will get on the phone and, and uh, call in the sub, and he would force himself on the stage anyway. Well, on the stage, he could play. Mm -hmm. On the stage, the music dominated. When the music was dominant, his mind was in the right state, focuses on the music. He transcended the trumpet, and he learned to make his mind more and more powerful. And that's the secret of Jacob. Jacob's had a physical, was very weak physically, 
and the secret was that his mind was more and more Strong. powerful yeah. to, to compensate for the physical weakness. And uh, he would say, you know, strength is your enemy, weakness, weakness is your friend. <laughs> and what he meant with that by that was that uh, it doesn't require a lot of physical strength, but it requires a lot of mental strength. And he was wi willing to make that commitment. And um, that was the most important thing that I learned from him. Oh, that's great. And that's what I communicate now, is that the mind, the trombone, the tuba, the trumpet, the horn, and the mind is the one that's important, and that the one in the hands is uh, a very little importance. So. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Roger, um, there's a legendary recording with Schulte and Chicago Symphony that you're a part of, a 1972 Grammy Award winning Symphony Fantastique. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if there are any stories, uh, any memories related to that? Uh, well, there, there are, are many uh, wonderful memories and lessons that I learned from the experience of having that opportunity. The, the performances were uh, local in Chicago, and then we took the, uh, the piece on an East Coast tour, uh, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Carnegie Hall, and so on. And um, the experience of, of working with, uh, with Schulte was, uh, first of all, he, he loved young brass players. And at the time, I was uh, probably uh, 72, I was 23 years old. Uh, it was an opportunity to work with a great maestro, and uh, he was very encouraging of uh, the sound that Jake and I would produce. As a matter of fact, the more sound that we produced, the happier he was about it. And um, it was never, we never intended to record the piece. Oh. But um, we played a performance at Carnegie Hall that uh, is, was an experience that few people in their lives ever have an opportunity. At the end of the performance, my heart was pounding in my chest, and uh, the audience was hysterical at <laughs> what they heard. And they started to, to take the programs and rip the programs up wow. and throw them on the stage, the paper on the stage like confetti, yeah. and they wouldn't stop. Wow. They were going crazy, and my heart was pounding in the chest. I remember, I remember that I had to take three breaths for the last note. <laughs> it was so loud. Wow. That last C, the active C. Yeah. There. And um, Jake leaned over to me, and this was a true comment. He said, well, we've always played like this, but before Schulte, no one knew. Um, yeah. So we went on to play in Philadelphia, and we went on to play it in... Um, in Washington, D.C. And then at one point, Jake said to me, don't be surprised that when we get back to Chicago, we're going to record this. Really? And sure enough. Wow. And sure enough, uh, I got the call. We were uh, scheduled to record it at the University of Illinois, Cranham Center. So the recording was scheduled for two days. And of course, the, uh, the tubas don't play the first three movements. The low brass don't play. So, but Schulte wanted us down there anyhow in case there was some extra time and let's try this or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first day we didn't play, but they had no microphones for the brass at all. And uh, Dale Clevenger and, and Bud Herseth were quite upset that uh, there was no microphones. So the next day, Jacobs leans over to me. We, uh, the procedure was to play through both the fourth and fifth movement. He said, don't, don't play it like we do at the concerts because <laughs> there's no microphones, no one's going to hear it. Mm -hmm. So we just played it at a moderate volume level. Orchestra took a break. Schulte went back to listen to the uh, performance. And we came out, and there was a microphone right in front of our music stand, right between us, Wow, <laughs> a microphone. And Schulte said, uh, gentlemen, play it like you do at the concerts. Let's hear it. And so we hauled off, and we played it like the concert. The sound was crackling off the walls. And Schulte was grinning. And uh, he said to the engineers backstage, uh, it sounds beautiful out here. What does it sound like back there? And he says, uh, and they said, but Maestro, we can't hear the bassoons. Well, <laughs> I, had nev I never knew there was bassoons there. <laughs> because it was always so loud. Schulte almost fell off the, stair off the podium. He says, I don't care about the bassoons. 
<laughs> so <laughs> my dears, <laughs> my dears, yeah, my dears. And so we went back and we played it, and it was it's wonderful. But something I learned recently, a story that was told to me by somebody who was at the recording session, one of the students who was a university student at the time, was backstage with the, with the engineers who were making the recording. So he was watching this. Mm. When it came time for us to actually record it, he turned the microphone off. So what you hear is no microphone at all. Wow, it's just acoustic from the just, other microphones. It was other just microphones. picked up from the other instruments. Wow. So the impact of that sound. And all I had to do was just open my ears and listen to what was happening in my right. Yeah. And uh, it was as if he was playing met me. Wow. That's a great story. It was a wonderful this story. Is, that's a grand finale, I think. <laughs> Roger, we can't thank you well, enough, Pebbles and I, Pebbles and I for taking the time to meet well, with us. And uh, it's my first time to Bourbonnet, and uh, it's a well, lovely town. If it wasn't for this great man, none of us would be here today. And um, I'll spend the rest of my life thanking him for what he gave me and the opportunity to share that with the rest of the world. Well, we'd like to thank you, Puddles and I. I'd uh, like to thank you for, the, for taking the time with some uh, genuine University of Oregon duck food, chocolate nut toffee. <laughs> we thank hope you. that you and yours will enjoy Bravo. that. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, my pleasure. It's great seeing you again. Yeah. Yeah. Now back to you.